I invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning for equipping hour to Exodus 24. Exodus 24. And the title for this morning's equipping hour is Experiences. Experiences. Perhaps you've had a mountaintop experience some wonderful providential encounter with God. Maybe you've been to summer camp. Now you'll have to put out of your mind and recent memories the apocalyptic summer camp that we just had as a church for our students. Uh, That was an unforgettable moment. Uh, Some of the first timers at the summer camp have said to their parents, is summer camp always like this? Thankfully, that was unusual. I remember the resolved conferences that this church benefited from, attended every single year, every single resolved conference a large contingent of this church went to, and in its last iteration, the resolved conference came here. It was renamed the Anchored Conference and was hosted in downtown Phoenix. And that last conference was truly remarkable. We sat under sermon after sermon after sermon. We had a foretaste of heaven. We sang all those Enfield songs. And the last iteration, the last segment of the last conference in that great run ended with a song, Finally Home. And Enfield played it. We all sang it at the tops of our lungs. It was a foretaste of heaven. It felt like a reunion ahead of time of the saints in glory. And when it was all over, everyone just stood and clapped and clapped and clapped and clapped and clapped until Enfield sang it again. And we all sang the song again. And then when it was done the second time, we all just stood around sort of a stunned silence. Looking back at what we had just experienced and looking forward to heaven. What a great providential gift of the Lord a conference like that was. It was an experience. And full confession, I have sinned since then. My faith has wavered. My devotion to the Lord has tanked. My Bible reading has waned. My prayer has become insipid and dull. I have forgotten about heaven. I don't know about you, but for me, that experience did not carry enduring faith. And do you know it couldn't? That experience did not have power to sustain Faith. It was a gift of God, providential, glorious, <laughs> memorable, and yet it does not by itself produce holiness, growth in Christ, growth in faith. And the reality is uh, that experience sort of just happened to us. We We made reservations, we bought tickets, we went, we attended, the songs were flung at us and sermons were preached at us and no doubt the word of God did things in us, but we were recipients. We were participants to the degree that our hearts and our minds were engaged by the power of the Holy Spirit in those moments. And so it was good. But its goodness did not go past what God would intend in it. And I would suggest to you this morning that your experiences with God cannot sustain your fidelity to God. And so we just want to put experiences in their place. We're grateful for them, but experiences do not have the ability to replace discipline, holiness, sanctification, mind renewal, endurance in trials, Because those experiences do not require enduring faith. So you think about a camp, a retreat, a conference, a Sunday morning service can be such an experience. A particular devotional time with the Lord can be a mountaintop experience. And those are good. They have their place. 
I want to share with you this morning a mountaintop experience from Exodus 24. In Exodus 24, we have this remarkable and perhaps often forgotten scene. God said to Moses, verse 1, Come up to Yahweh, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and you all shall worship at a distance. Moses alone, however, shall come near to Yahweh, but they shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. Then Moses came and recounted to the people all the words of Yahweh and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice, all the words which Yahweh has spoken, we will do. They all have had an experience that motivated a profession of loyalty and a promise of obedience. Moses wrote down all the words of Yahweh. Then he arose early in the morning, built an altar at the foot of the mountain with 12 pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the sons of Israel, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as peace offerings to Yahweh. Moses took half of the blood, put it in basins. The other half he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that Yahweh has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. So Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which Yahweh has cut with you in accordance with all these words. Look at verse 9. Then Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And under his feet there appeared to be a pavement of sapphire as clear as the sky itself. Yet he did not stretch out his hand against the nobles of the sons of Israel, and they beheld God, and they ate and drank. This was an experience. These people, these sinful humans, had dinner with Yahweh. Yahweh spread out a banquet for them on the top of a mountain and invited them to come and eat and to drink in his presence. One could only imagine what the food there would have been like. And he didn't destroy them. To sit down in Yahweh's presence and taste food and taste beverage with each other and with him and this crystalline sapphire pavement spread beneath and Yahweh in his glory shining before them. You would never forget such a thing. What a remarkable experience this is. I believe that experience with the 70 elders and with the men assembled there is a preview of what we read in Isaiah chapter 25. I want you to turn there and see it. And just so we get a little bit of the context here, Isaiah 24 and 25 detail for us sort of end times events. And the chronology of these end times events moves us from the tribulation period through the millennial kingdom era into the eternal state. It's interesting how it appears in that order. The same order it shows up in Matthew 24 and 25, the same order it shows up in a number of other places. Chapter 24 details the tribulation where God will unleash judgments against the earth. And look at the end of chapter 24 in verse 23. The moon will be humiliated and the sun ashamed for Yahweh of armies will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and his glory will be before his elders. That's a picture of the millennial kingdom. When Christ, Yahweh in the flesh, reigns in Jerusalem before his people, shining in his glory. Not the invisible providential reign of, of God who is king over all things at all time, not his providential sovereignty, but his manifest personal reign on the earth. And, and then that moves into verse six of chapter 25, into the eternal state where we read this, Yahweh of armies will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on this mountain. 
a banquet of aged wine, choice pieces with marrow, and refined aged wine. And on this mountain he will swallow up the covering which is over all peoples, the veil which is stretched over all nations. What is this covering? What is this veil? I think it is explained in poetic parallelism in the next verse. This is the curse as a result of sin culminating in death. Notice what he says in verse 8, Yahweh will swallow up death for all time, and the Lord Yahweh will wipe tears away from all faces, and he will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth, for Yahweh has spoken. And it will be said in that day, behold, this is our God in whom we have hoped that he would save us. This is Yahweh in whom we have hoped. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation." All the waiting, all the hope, all the faith, all the anticipation culminated in the eternal state where there's no more believing in what you cannot see, trusting in what you have not yet experienced, but the actual experience of the things God has promised. That's an eternal state reality. What the 70 elders and Nadab and Abihu and Aaron and Moses all got to experience on the mountain in Matthew 24 was a preview experience of that final culmination. And what's fascinating about that scene in Exodus 24 is it reflects the banqueting in Isaiah 25. It, it reflects the crystalline pavement before the throne of God that we see in Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. It reflects the eternal state, New Jerusalem, come down out of heaven onto the new earth in Revelation 21, this city of, of brilliant gold crystalline, where even the streets are this gold so pure that you can see through it. Now, if you know anything about streets outside of 20th, 21st century Western civilization, now, we think of asphalt and concrete. Ancient city streets were paved with refuse, compacted down to make a hard surface. We were uh, at a staycation last week at a hotel, and the smell that permeated the hallways every once in a while of our staycation was the smell of the open trash bin. And you sort of forget, as we've sanitized our culture, how awful rotting trash smells. As a college student at Moody Bible Institute in downtown Chicago, there were days where the wind carried the, the aroma of the chocolate factory through the campus. And you go, oh, I love Chicago. And then there were other days where the wind blew the other direction. And, and the whole place just smelled of city trash. What's fascinating about the streets of gold in the new heavens and new earth, it means the, the things that get trampled under the feet, the, the worst spots of the city are this most valuable treasure we can't even understand this side of heaven. And so in this Exodus 24 scene, you have this sapphire crystalline pavement that's pre-reminiscent of the eternal state. And this banqueting in Yahweh's presence, that is a preview of the eternal state. They got to see remarkable things. Consider the cast of characters here in Exodus 24. Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu. These were the, the sons in the priestly line that had first access and privilege to the sacrificial system and the glorious presence of Yahweh in the tabernacle. And then the 70 elders of Israel. These were the respectable, respected leaders of the nation whose task was to have responsibilities of caring for the people delegated to them to teach the law of God, to instruct the people, to give wisdom, to act as judges, arbitrating on behalf of the people. There are times when the elders of Israel are speaking the law of Yahweh alongside Moses. This was a privileged group. This was a, a group with high responsibility, but also a group with high privilege. 
What an amazing experience they would have at the front end to see the glory of God and experience the grace of God personally and experientially. A really remarkable group. They are remarkable, of course, not only for their experience in Exodus 24. Let's think about these 70 elders of Israel for a moment. When we think about the people of Israel, led and cared for by these elders of Israel, the the people took on the results of failed leadership by those elders. The people were characterized by complaint and bitterness and mutinies. The elders themselves were guilty of complaining against Moses, complaining against the Lord in their hearts and out loud. And just to summarize the whole scene, I want you to turn to Numbers chapter 21. In verse 4, we read, the people became impatient on the way, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water. Is that true? Is there no food and no water? We know that there is food and water because they're alive enough to complain about there being no food and no water. If there was no water in the desert, they would have been dead already. If there was no food in the desert, they'd be dead in weeks and not moving. They're wandering. They have been sustained. In fact, we know they've been sustained miraculously. We know they've been provided for by God's grace over and over and over again in their clothing, in the provision of water, in their provision of sustaining food and even in the provision of meat when they complained. But we also know they had food because of their complaint. Did you catch this in verse 5? There's no food and no water, and we loathe this miserable food. And you who have raised teenagers, you know, there's no food in this house, mom. And miraculously, mom is able to take the ingredients in the home and provide a wonderful, lavish banquet. How did that happen? This is just complaining in the heart, speaking against God, speaking against Moses. Look at Leviticus chapter 10. The priestly line under Mosaic covenant was given immense responsibility and immense privilege to draw near to the Lord, to be on the front row seat, to see the benefits of substitutionary atonement. Day after day after day, a sinner walking up to the temple, guilty of sin and worthy of death, would walk up to the temple, offer a sacrifice, and walk away forgiven. Because an innocent animal substituted made a way of reconciliation of relationship to a holy God. Could you imagine being party to that day after day after day? It's an amazing privilege. Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans and put fire in them. Then they placed incense on it and offered strange fire before Yahweh, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from the presence of Yahweh and consumed them, and they died before Yahweh. Moses said to Aaron, It is what Yahweh spoke, saying, By those who come near to me, I will be treated as holy, and before all the people I will be glorified. So Aaron kept silent. First day on the job, didn't follow the instructions, gone. It's a striking and tragic scene. God will be treated as holy. His people will follow his directions. Why has God given directions to his people? Why all of these steps that must be followed? 
Why all the prohibitions about steps that should not be followed? Why the particulars about how to go about this? This was all Yahweh's very gracious opportunity for sinful people to get close to him and not be incinerated. How will sinners access the goodness and the blazing glory and the infinite holiness of their maker and survive it? Only if God himself graciously provides a way, covering, covering Adam and Eve's shame and guilt with a substitute animal skin covering his people in the wilderness with the animal sacrifices in the tabernacle worship, covering all his people for all time through faith in the death of his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is just critical to understand. And and, and the message from Nadab and Abihu is you don't rewrite the script. You don't change the prescriptions. You you don't play willy-nilly or fast and loose with what God says. I have a better way to do that. Ah, let's just add some incense to the fire pan. God didn't say to do that. God said to do it this way. We don't mess around with the holiness of God and His gracious provision for access to Him. This is why Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 5, take care with your steps when you approach the temple. We dare not lose sight of this. So Nadab and Abihu had the mountaintop experience. They saw the glory of God. They experienced the grace of God. They ate a meal with Yahweh. They got a preview of heaven. And that could not sustain their fidelity to obedience to God's word. Think about Aaron. Turn to Exodus 32. Just a little bit of background here so we have the context. Exodus 32 comes in your Bible after Exodus 24. Do we understand the chronology there? So Aaron got to be invited to dinner with Yahweh and saw his glory and experienced his grace. And then we have Exodus 32. The people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, so the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, Arise, make us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. That was one of my dad's favorite verses, by the way. If any of his sons ever had an earring, tear the earring out of your son's ear. It was a little out of context. Sorry, that was unnecessary rabbit trail. Then all the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now, whether Aaron was inventing new deities, reflecting surrounding pagan deities, or he was saying... Yahweh did it, and we'll just celebrate it in this unprecedented and unsanctioned way. All of it's wrong. Aaron looked and built an altar before it. Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to Yahweh. And and who was the feast to? We find out in the next verse. So the next day they rose early, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. And the play there is probably an immoral revelry. They've decided on idolatrous and immoral partying as a sacrifice to deities of molten jewelry in the shape of animals. This violates just about everything when it comes to the worship of God. And who did it? Aaron. Of course, you hear his blame shifting later. I I don't know, people gave me their earrings and out came these golden calves. This is tragic compromise at a leadership level that affects the entire nation. In fact, it provokes God's ire. If you follow along the narrative in the rest of the chapter, God says, Moses, out of the way. I'm going to destroy all of the people. 
and then this rabbit trail is worth going down, Moses intercedes. Moses prays for the people. God says, Moses, I'm going to make a nation out of you. Now, Moses, by God's declaration, was the humblest guy to walk the earth. Anybody but Moses would have said, huh, nation out of me? All right. I'll go along with that. Sounds pretty good. Not Moses. Moses appeals on the basis of God's covenant fidelity, God's faithfulness to his own character and his own promises. And he says, remember your promises you made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What were those promises? Promises through the Abrahamic line, Isaac's line, Joseph's line, or Israel, and all the tribes, which includes 12 tribes, including the tribe of Levi, which had the priestly duties, but also the tribe of Judah, which was promised by God an inviolable covenant to produce the kingly line, which would produce Messiah, to actually bring us forgiveness of sin that all those animal sacrifices point to and didn't have power in themselves to provide. We needed the line of Judah. If God wiped out the nation and made a new nation out of Moses, Moses is not in the line of Judah. We don't have a Messiah. We don't have our sins forgiven. We're all hell bound or God's a liar. And the text in Exodus 32 tells us God changed his mind. Now don't believe for a minute that God changed his mind from his character, his purposes, his attributes, which do not change, or his promises, which he cannot break, to a plan B. What did God change his mind about? God changed his mind in this text from judgment threatened to promises kept. And how did God go about keeping his promise? He had a man, a humble man, who didn't want a position, but loved the glory of God, bound up in his covenant-keeping nature, and appealed to God through prayer. What do we learn from Exodus 32? Prayer works. Prayer changes the heart of God not in his ontology, not in his being or his attributes or his purposes or his promises, but God uses prayer to change history according to his promises and his plan. God uses means to accomplish what he planned to do from the foundation of the world. It is a remarkable scene. Can't help but think that the, the glory of God that Moses had access to the grace of God, which Moses experienced in a mountaintop moment, would help fuel Moses' faith. But we've already seen, not everybody who experienced that mountaintop moment had the same degrees of faith or appreciation of the holiness of God. Of course, when you get to Numbers 12, <clears throat> excuse me, when you get to Numbers 12, Aaron himself is speaking against Moses and has to be rebuked by the Lord. As humble as Moses was, as faithful as Moses was, Moses was not flawless. Turn to Numbers chapter 20. If to whatever degree Moses' mountaintop experiences with the Lord were an aid to him, a confidence building for him to walk in fidelity to Yahweh, it is obvious they did not have the power to keep Moses faithful forever. In Numbers 20, we read in verse 6, Moses and Aaron came in from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tent of meeting. They fell on their faces. The glory of Yahweh appeared to them. Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, take the rod you and your brother Aaron assemble the congregation and speak to the rock before their eyes that the rock may yield its water. You shall thus bring forth water out of the rock and let the congregation and their beasts drink. So Moses took the rod from before Yahweh, just as he had commanded them. Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock and he said to them, listen now, you rebels, shall we bring forth water for you out of this rock? Moses raised high his hand and struck the rock twice. 
Water came forth abundantly, the congregation and their beasts drank. But Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron, and notice the phrase here, because you did not believe me, to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I've given them. This is a severe consequence for a little slip, perhaps. Or this unbelief manifested in Moses' disobedience, and it's, it, it's not a disobedience at the big picture thing. What, what did God tell Moses to do? There's a rock, rocks don't make water, but go get water out of the rock. I'm going to provide for my people. They're going to know it's me. Moses, go do it. Moses obeyed in the, in the big sense, but, but Moses disobeyed in the how. God was very specific. Speak to the rock. There were other times that Moses struck the rock, and that's what he was supposed to do. Here he was commanded by Yahweh to speak to the rock. And his changing Yahweh's, to, Yahweh's command to what Moses decided he would do instead, probably provoked by frustration over the people's recalcitrance, probably in anger, Moses strikes the rock. He disobeys Yahweh before a watching crowd, and God is displeased. God calls it unbelief. And the consequence of that is Moses would die and not enter the promised land at least during the Exodus. Someday he will. It's a remarkable scene. As we think about this cast of characters, 70 elders of Israel, Nadab, Abihu, Aaron, and Moses, these are the men who went up and ate with Yahweh on the mountain. That would have been an unforgettable experience. You and I would walk away from something like that and say, guess what I did? It would be so memorable, etched in their minds, bragging rights, one-upmanship, perhaps. None of those who had that mountaintop experience with the Lord went into the promised land. None of them. They all died in the wilderness. Look at Numbers 20, uh, 26, excuse me, chapter 26 and verse 65. Yahweh said of them, they shall surely die in the wilderness, and not a man was left of them except Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. So all these that had the mountaintop experience, they all died in the desert. They didn't enter the land that God had prepared for them and promised to them. Their experience could not carry them through with enduring faith. And listen, they had all experienced much more than that Exodus 24 mountaintop meal with God. Do you remember the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night? This miraculous provision of God to protect them and show them the way. They all experienced that on a daily basis. Had they become so comfortable with the miracle that they lost sight of the profound holiness and privilege of the presence of God. Of course, they all experienced the miraculous provision of water and food in the desert. Their clothes didn't wear out. Their sandals didn't wear out. They had three square meals a day, and they had water for all of them and for all of their animals. That was miraculous. They all experienced the gracious provision of the wealth from the Egyptians which God plundered on their behalf. They were walking around with jewelry and porpoise skins that they didn't make. They, they came out of Egypt as slaves and they came out wealthy because God provided for them. They all had experienced the rescue from Egyptian slavery and the defeat of Pharaoh's army. They knew what it was like to be cornered against the sea between a rock and a hard place, between a, an opposing army and nowhere to go. And God rescued them by parting the sea and then destroying the army that pursued them. They all saw the ten plagues 
and the grace of God in those. They had all seen these things. They had all benefited from the mighty hand of the angel of Yahweh, which I believe is the pre-incarnate Christ, whose task it was to get them safely through their dangers into the promised land. They all drank from the same rock. They all experienced the protection of the angel of Yahweh. It seemed that Christ's task before coming to the earth was to get his people on the way into the promised land. And this first generation all perished in their unbelief. Even Moses himself was prohibited from entering the land expressly for his lack of faith. You did not believe me to treat me as holy before the people. Have you had mountaintop experiences with God? Have you experienced the crash spiritually afterwards? Maybe you've had the foxhole experience of, Lord, if you will just get me out of this jam, I will serve you forever. I will never sin in that way again. I will, I will, I won't, I won't. And you make promises. Maybe like Peter's. I won't deny you. Bold, courageous fidelity followed by weak, faithed disobedience. Listen, these mountaintop experiences are good. (laughs) There's no doubt they're good. They're previews of good things to come, but they cannot sustain our fidelity. We ought to be grateful for them, but not replace discipline with an experience. Not replace holiness with an experience. The the pursuit of sanctification, the, the my will and working according to God's power for Christ likeness. We cannot replace daily Bible reading with something that's just handed to you as an experience. You cannot replace disciplined prayer with something that's just done in your presence by an experience. And listen, nothing is as good as trials in shaping us. Nobody buys tickets to a weekend experience of trial because you know you're going to grow by it. But don't you know already that you've grown more by your trials and God's good hand than you did at the last wonderful conference you were at? We're grateful for the experiences. But if you and I live from experience to experience, thinking that our spiritual mountaintop experiences will be the fuel for faithful living, we will crash and burn. And, and I spent some time as a young man in a theological context that just flat out believed the experiences on a Sunday were the place you got your fuel for the spiritual life. Spiritual disciplines like prayer and Bible reading and short accounts with God over sin and repentances were nowhere in the vocabulary, but come to church on Sunday and there's a show and there's music and it's exciting and the adrenaline gets pumping and we sing and sing and sing until we're delirious and we can't think of anything anymore and then we're knocked over by the slaying of the Spirit. I experienced all of those things and I loved it. And I couldn't wait for the next experience because then I would be on this spiritual high. But if you grew up in those circles, if if you've had time in those kinds of spiritual circles, you you know that the, the high wears off. The mountaintops get sheared and the plateaus are lower until eventually you're in Death Valley. And no experience can bring you back to that thing you felt which motivated high thoughts of God. It's a grievous disappointment. And those experiences are only a disappointment if we have given them too much credit. Do you understand? We need to be together. We need to sing songs. It's good to be moved by God's word. There is something that happens when we are all together and the word of God is preached and we pray together and we sing the same words at the same time to one another. Every Sunday ought to be an experience. But we do not invest those experiences with power beyond their ability. 
Your sustained growth in Christ needs other things. Faithful living is wrought in the mundane. It's worked out in the boring. It is conceived in the trial, shaped in the difficulty. The disciplined fight of faith to trust God and to yield our wills to His ways, step by step, happens on the flat ground of everyday life and sometimes most pointedly in the crags of difficulty. We are to believe what God has said when we can't see what God is doing. We are to depend on God's provision. We are to obey God's commands. And there will be mountaintop experiences. There's a value in them. They get our attention. Uh, A conference can reorient our lives, recalibrate our thoughts. A Sunday morning, a small group midweek, a summer camp, next week's men's conference. Be a part of these things. But you need to know there's a difference between experiences and experientialism. Experiences are God's providences. Experientialism is the view that I must have an experience in order to be faithful. I must have an experience, an encounter with God to know that he's there. In order to to have good credentials for living out the Christian life. One of the weaknesses of an experience, and this is the fundamental flaw of experientialism, is that our experiences are uninterpreted. That is, they they don't come with their own explanation. They are providential, personal happenings in time and space, but they don't come with an instruction manual. This is what happened to you, and this is what it's about. They don't explain themselves. So the experiences can be variously interpreted by those who experience them. Just consider the scene at the tomb of Lazarus in John 11. Lazarus really experienced something. Mary and Martha really experienced something. But the crowd of people called the Jews, everybody in the scene is Jewish, it's not an ethnicity statement. Uh, The Jews is John's way of describing the, the group of Jewish people who were hostile to Messiah and his message. They harbored internal criticisms of Jesus. They weren't invisible to Christ. He saw through them all. But they perhaps were shielded from the eyes of observers at a human level. They were there. They were present. They saw Lazarus raised from the dead. Jesus uttered a command, and a dead man obeyed it, and he walked out of his own tomb. And they had to unwrap his head and unbind his hands. And then here is Lazarus, who had been dead four days, surely dead, absolutely dead, beyond the realm of of Jewish uh, mythical interpretation that his soul would be hovering over there for a couple of days. No, he is way past all of that. Decomposition would have set in. And here he is now walking around. And there are two different responses. Many believed, even some of those Jews. But others went and ratted out Jesus to the religious leadership with the intent to set him up that Jesus would be killed. And do you know what they did in John 12? They sought out Lazarus to kill him too. Bury, rebury the evidence. <laughs> Those are two totally different reactions to the same experience. And what makes the difference? The condition of the heart. The condition of the heart governs the interpretation of the experience. The experience doesn't come with its own placard that shapes what you do with it. And and that was a real historical objective experience. I don't know what we do with our own subjective impressions of experiences that are even farther removed from reality at times. The other weakness of experiences is they are unrepeatable. You just can't ever have the same experience twice. There may be similarities between things, but 
You just can't repeat the experience. If you're looking for the excitement level, the spiritual adrenaline, the fuel for your Christian life from that experience, and you think you're going to get it by signing up for the next conference, you misunderstand. You misunderstand God's purpose for those experiences. Experientialism expects the wrong work from the providential and the miraculous. By the way, if you were to sort of tally up all the miracles in the Bible, we mean those special works of God that contravene the laws of nature God has set up and is sovereign over, that, that go beyond the regular providential acting of the king of the universe on his creation. Things we would say, oh, that was a miracle. That, that is impossible by any other explanation than that God transcended the laws of nature. If you were just to tally up everything that you believe fell into that category in your Bible and then locate them on the timeline of human history, those miracles are actually very few and far between. If you count up all the personal encounters of a sinful human being in time and space encountering the glory of the presence of God, those are few and far between, far between. Sometimes we normalize them because we read our Bibles. Just know that what the Bible recorded is actual history. Those are real historical events that happened. And it's appropriate that God recorded the high points and the apex moments of his revelation of himself and his regulation of his people, the giving of the law and the doing of miracles. A lot of miracles in Moses' day, a lot of miracles in the days of Elijah and Elisha, a lot of miracles, of course, at the time when God himself takes on flesh in the earthly ministry of Jesus the Messiah. And then some miracles trailing off in the lives of the apostles who had to have the credentials of having been with Jesus. Outside of those, the Bible is nearly silent about miracles and those kinds of firsthand experiences and encounters with the glory of God. That's not the norm. And we can make those things the norm in our lives and expect things from them. Experientialism can actually reveal in us a lack of faith in God's normal, gracious provisions for life and godliness. He has given us everything we need for life and godliness. I can disbelieve that and hope that some experience will give me what I don't want to believe God has already given me in the gracious resources He's provided. Consider the indwelling Holy Spirit powerful to work in us to make us Christ-like. It's actually what he sets out to do. He's jealous for our spirit. He brings us from one stage of glory to another in progressive conformity to Christ, 1 Corinthians 3.18. He leads us to put to death the deeds of the body. That is supernatural power internally by God who dwells in us in his spirit of holiness. Don't short him. He is not a force or a power to tap into, or some impersonal aura. He is a person who can be grieved and who leads and who does supernatural work in us. That is God's normal, gracious, unbelievable provision for us for life and godliness. Don't short his word. You can look for experiences all day long outside of his word. I just want God to say something, do something so that I know he's real. He's given us something far better. Inscripturated, written. Do you, do you know why your Bible is written and not oral tradition? Telephone games, second hand, third hand, 18th hand experiences of someone else's encounter with God? Do you know why God's communication to you is not personal, audible, in time, whenever you need it? Because we're sinners and our memories are bad and we mess up the telephone game. We don't hear right. We don't repeat right. It is in Scripture because the Word of God is forever settled in heaven, and on earth God has fixed it for us so that we understand His heart and His mind in a reliable way, an unchangeable way. 
And I'm just gonna confess for a moment, sometimes my Bible seems boring to me. It's just gonna say the same thing today that it said yesterday. (laughs) What is that in us? That is a restlessness, a lack of faith in God's provision that gravitates toward an experience. Experientialism can also reveal in us a fundamental godlessness in our faith. Experientialism brings up in us this desire for an experience, and we forget the who. We are to know Him, and listen, encountering God is an experience. Encountering God in His Word, encountering God in some miraculous event, encountering God in some first-hand, face-to-face experience, being ushered into the third heaven, 2 Corinthians 12, as Paul was. Exodus 24, being on a mountaintop and eating a meal before Yahweh in His glory. Those would be experiences. But if we're really excited about, man, this exciting thing happened to me, we like the adrenaline rush. We like the bragging rights. We, we just like the happening. Then there is a godlessness in the gravitational pull towards experiences. We need the who. That is the definition of eternal life, knowing God and the one whom he sent. We miss knowing God if if our gravitational pull is to the experience, the thrill. So this is the place of faith, enduring faith, the, the, the biblical theology of waiting on the Lord. It is simply trust multiplied by time. It is, I believe what God said, and I may not experience anything tomorrow, but I'm going to believe tomorrow what he said already. This is what faith is. It is the enduring trust when we can't see, when we don't experience. Faith in the face of adversity. Faith until the consummation. It is a dependence upon God when things are going really, really well. Lord, let me not be so rich that I forget you. Proverbs 30. Let me not so poor, be so poor that I despise you and curse you. <laughs> That's a good balance. And it is hard to have your faith sustained in God when He is graciously providing a comfortable, easy life for you. That ought to provoke gratitude and an awareness, a cognizance of God's gracious provision all the time. And we just get fat, dumb, and happy, and we forget. We need enduring faith when things are going well. And of course, we need enduring faith in dark valleys and deep shadows, the narrow crags of trial and difficulty. We need a dependence upon God in all of these things, a settled trust in Him. Turn to Matthew 17. It is just kind of fun if you chase out in your Bible the mountaintop experiences. These are like literal mountains. (laughs) People are on the top of them with God. Matthew 17 is, of course, the transfiguration the uncloaking of the Son of God during His earthly existence. Six days later, Jesus brought with Him Peter, James, and John, led them up on a high mountain by themselves. This is reminiscent of high mountains we've seen before in Scripture. He was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and His garments became as white as light. Can you imagine You'd been walking around with this man from Galilee, this Nazarene, and he's just a guy. And all of a sudden, his face shines like the sun. Behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with them. I don't know how to make this comparison for a, for a Jewish man in the first century to all of a sudden be having a conversation with Moses and Elijah. I mean, who do you think of? John Wayne and Ronald Reagan? Winston Churchill? George Washington? I mean, what what comes to your mind when you think, I can't, 
They're here, and I'm talking to them. These are amazing experiences. And so Peter, quick to speak, foot-shaped mouth, <laughs> says these endearing words. Lord, it, it's good to be here. Can we build tents? Moses, Elijah, us. Can we stick around? And while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Um, a bright cloud. Interesting. And a voice out of the cloud. This is the son of my love, my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. There's so much going on in this scene. What is the result? They fall on their faces, and then it's just Jesus alone. What an experience. How long did their humbling before God fall on their faces? I can't believe what we just saw. We were instructed from God the Father in the presence of the law and the prophets to now listen to the son of his love. Wow, we're forever changed. Man, isn't this great? And we read Matthew 18, and you read the parallel accounts in Luke 9 and Mark 9. Then they see Jesus' power over demons. And the next conversation they have, hey, what, which one of us do you think is the greatest? And Jesus says, what were you guys talking about on the way? Of course, he already knew. Their experience did not produce endurance of faith. It didn't produce an enduring humility. There's a real danger in these experiences. Here's Peter's own testimony. Of course, the three that were up there with Moses, Elijah, and Jesus, and the Father by voice were Peter, James, and John. What does Peter say about that experience? Second Peter chapter one. You should turn there and look at it. Verse 16 end of the verse, we were eyewitnesses of Jesus' majesty. He's referring there to that scene in Matthew 17, the transfiguration. When he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. We ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Period, end of the chapter, our experience. Trump card, my story's better than all yours. That's not where the chapter ends. That's not where Peter's argument ends. He says, and we have as more sure the prophetic word. What does he mean by that? The Bible. The, the, the apostles and the New Testament of prophets receiving direct revelation are getting the guidance from God in fixed form for the church era. And that is better than the experience on the mountain. It is, according to Peter here in verse 19, more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. Verse 20, know this, no prophecy of Scripture comes by one's own interpretation. No prophecy was ever made by the will of man, but men being moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. What does Peter say about his experiences? The dual authorship of the New Testament is better. What we saw, we could tell you about, but the interpretation's up to the hearer. What we saw, we could tell you about, but it's not repeatable. You didn't experience what we experienced, and we can't give you the effects of it. In fact, we didn't do so well in the effects of it. We walked around right afterwards comparing each other to each other. Who's the greatest? But what can sustain your faith? A disciplined paying attention to the prophetic word of God, to the Bible to God's fixed, inscripturated word. What do you need for the Christian life? Spiritual disciplines. Fellowship and encouragement with one another. Short accounts with God over sin. All of the things that the Bible prescribes for us to grow. 
Let me tell you about one more experience, the one that's coming for all who believe in Christ. You'll be in heaven. What was previewed in Exodus 24 and Isaiah 25 and Isaiah 6 and Ezekiel 1 and Revelation 4 and 5, what we read about in Revelation 21 and 22, you will be there and it will be an experience and you will be sinless. You will be unable to lose sight of the glory of God in it. You will not be there for the adrenaline rush that you have to keep getting pumped up by. It will be real. Your faith will turn to sight. Absence will turn to presence. That's coming. Experiences are good. But for now, we walk by faith. According to the provision of God's grace that he supplies for us to walk by faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these words from you. Reminders that our mountaintop experiences with you can be very good and helpful but we recognize they cannot sustain our enduring faith. And so we ask for your help to walk the Christian life in the mundane, to trust your provision of spiritual disciplines, of being together as a body of believers, of sitting under your word preached, of reading your word written, of spending time with you in prayer, of yielding our wills to you in obedience. We ask for your help to walk this walk of faith. In Jesus' name, amen.